So what we want to do is to jump into some of the extended persistence concepts. So once again, module three is a part two of persistence. And in the enterprise or corporate environment, um, you move away from the local floppy disk or hard disk. You, you, you don't work so much with local disks anymore. In fact, there are some places that that actually operate with headless systems and uh, diskless systems, and they use um, much higher level, much more powerful uh, storage methods. And that's one thing that we want to take the time uh, to investigate. I want you to notice that the reading assignment um, in the previous module, you focused on, I think it was 38 through 40. We're going we're gonna to revisit some of those concepts. And so for that reason, those are still included. But chapters 36 and 37 in your textbook are specifically of interest. And uh, one of the things we want to make sure we understand very well is this whole idea of the, the storage device the storage um, volume as, as a device. So it's like any other device. It's like a network card or it's like a, a mouse and keyboard and a screen. You know, there's data flowing in and out, right? And so um, we know that in that sense, when it comes to computer architecture, if you go back to CSC 241, how many of you remember something about the North Bridge and the South Bridge data bus? Yeah, from architecture. Yes. So in typical terms, your memory, your RAM memory, and your uh, CPU and video, those are all very fast, very close to the processor. That's North Bridge on the data bus. The, um, basically, can everybody see my screen? Yes, we can see. Okay, so basically what you have is this uh, idea that the data disk read and writes are happening typically at a further distance from the CPU. And they are typically part of the south bridge. So they're further away from the, you know, so, so this... Uh, it's data bus that's closer to the graphics and CPU and memory, that's Northbridge. And then the peripherals uh, IO bus would be, you have specialized controllers. And that, that data bus is brokered through specialized controllers. So you have hard disk controllers, RAID controllers. We'll talk about RAID in a minute. And, you know, it's, it's one of the things that you wanna keep in mind. So as you start extending concepts for storage, and operating system persistence. One of the things that I find that is uh, really infuriating is that um, people don't understand the distance factor between the storage location and the CPU memory and graphics. In particular, and this is Microsoft being an evil, uh, an evil empire, but if you, if you don't see it on my screen, that's because I'm resisting it. But in the latest version, or feature release of Windows 10, by default, the documents are stored in OneDrive. In fact, many of you, when you look at your file explorer, you may see OneDrive prominently listed and uh, that's the default. So when you go to save something, it wants to save it to uh, the cloud. And the, the cloud is the extreme example of what we're talking about in terms of um, device I.O. The, uh, the other aspect of this that's important to understand is this concept of direct memory access. So there is a performance bottleneck and some of the hard disk controllers, in particular RAID, uh, redundant array of, of inexpensive disk, that's what the acronym stands for. It uses a specific and specialized controller which 
on the motherboard or, or data bus provides um, kind of like a, a direct, the direct flight to memory. So oftentimes you're, you're reading data into and out of, you're always actually, it's not ever, but you're always reading data out of the disk into memory and then from there into the CPU and then back. And the operating system has to have um, better methods of handling that transition and that traffic and uh, managing memory. And so memory management and process management is stuff we get into in the last modules of our course in the operating system. But, but one thing you wanna understand is that it all starts and ends here. And uh, we need to have a really strong idea of, of how that works. This idea of plug and play in Windows, they wanted to, they wanted to conquer the planet. And uh, in, in the Mac world, they basically defined all of the hardware that would work uh, with their operating system. But in Windows, they want Windows on any machine, every machine. And so they don't have any control over the hardware. And they came up with this concept of plug and play, meaning you have disks of all sorts of varieties and flavors. And now you have much faster, does, is, has anybody ever heard of, uh, um, USB 3.0 or 3.1? Yeah, I have. Yes. Okay. So, um, so you have this, um, you have this new series of external disk connections that allow for much faster external data. And the whole point is that, yeah, and it's across a USB-C connection. So 3.0 is gigabit speed, 3.1 is much faster. Um, Thunderbolt, has anyone heard of Thunderbolt connections? No, I've never heard of it. Okay, well, there's a similar standard in the Mac world, uh, let's see. So the ports on a Mac book or a Mac, they're also moderated through a USB-C connection, but the standard is not USB 3.1, it's Thunderbolt. It's the same basic concept. Um, it's very fast serial, uh, very fast serial connections. So what we have is this trend in the industry to move disk storage further and further away. And there are trade-offs. So when we talk about the different types of disk sector, well, are there any questions about what we've talked about to this point? So IO in the context of system architecture. Not right now. Okay. Um, this is also an important piece here now that I'm looking at this. So, you know, if it's a device, then every device has a device driver in terms of the operating system. And the device has an interface and it has internal components. So those are the two main physical aspects of a device. I'm gonna repeat that. So if you have a device, it has to have an interface and it has to have internal components. And if it doesn't have that, then you don't really have a device, in the most basic terms. And then you do need three uh, memory registers in order for the device to work properly. Whenever you're connecting a device, you need a register to, to basically account for the status of the device. You know, is it connected? Is it active? Second device for instructions. You know, one instructions, so the second register 
basically will handle or manage the instructions for that device, the input the, and the output. So the, the actual um, actions you can take. And then the third is for how to handle the data that's flowing in and out. And, and this, is, this is a convention that you're expected to understand and know. So a controller is a specialized, and this is also worth mentioning. I mentioned RAID controllers. RAID controllers can have very powerful CPUs. They can have memory, ECC, error correction memory, or buffered registered memory, and they can have their own data bus. So a hardware controller that connects a device is its own computer system. And this is, <laughs> this is a really important idea to grasp. You have an entity unto itself that sits between uh, the disks and the data bus, and it's this controller that has its own CPU memory and, and uh, secondary data bus built in. It has its own operating system. We call it firmware. When you have a smaller set of instructions, you know, you have smaller instruction sets and you have um, a different, you know, like a custom assembly language involved with that controller CPU and the memory, the dedicated memory, that's, you basically have a miniature operating system. And so this is a specialty field of operating systems, you know, firmware, embedded devices, you have smart refrigerators, you have, um, you have all sorts of things now that use firmware. And that's just, a, I want you to think of, I want you to think of firmware as a, an op, operating system in miniature. So that's the last aspect of, of, uh, IO in the context of system architecture, remember the data bus, remember it's a device, remember what the device components are. Okay, so one of the things we wanna do is kind of walk out the scheduling algorithms uh, for common uh, disk sets. And then we also wanna contrast uh, the different types of of corporate uh, storage options, and and we want we want you to be able to distinguish the differences between them. Um, so, basically, there's a, a fair amount of there's some quick information here about random versus sequential disk sector access. So that's about the second, that's about the second learning objective. And um, you do have some specialized disk sector act access technologies, in particular, something called SCSI, SCSI, uh, Small Computing Systems Interface. The name is sort of a misnomer because SCSI is found in some of the largest computing systems on the planet. So it's not a small computing. I mean, that, that hails back to the days of where you had mainframes. And so SCSI was a data bus. I'll, it was a, um, a, a disk sector access method. You, you have SATA, which is serial attached uh, storage, right? And that's similar to SCSI. That's a newer style. Some of you may have noodled around with system components and found, you know, when you had to replace a hard drive that you bought a SATA hard drive. So, so these are higher performance methods, but one of the things that you want to spend a little bit of time reading about in chapter 37 is this idea that you have um, basic methods that are first in, first out, and then you have more elegant methods that involve this concept of an elevator method, right? So the um, scan and C-scan methods employ um, this, this idea of, of the way an elevator works. What do we mean by that? Um, in a nutshell, if you get into an elevator and you happen to be, well, how often are you in an elevator all by yourself? 
in a, in a very large office building. Are, are you with me? Yeah, I'm, I was, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm gonna say not often. Not often, right. And so here's a question for you. Well, let, let's say that uh, the elevator is going up, right? And, and you got in first at the bottom and then it stops at three other floors and it picks up other people. And you need to go to the 21st floor and everybody else needs to get off in the teens, 13, 14, 15. Does the elevator drop you off at the 21st floor for, before it lets everybody else out? No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. No. That wouldn't be efficient, would it? Yeah, wouldn't, wouldn't make sense to do that. So that's part of the conceptual framework for this method and the elevator method. It has to do with uh, how the disk sector access is brokered or mediated. And, and that's, that's material that you do need to, to understand uh, on a basic level. I'm not gonna require you to know stuff that's in the weeds, the coding behind it, or the algorithms behind it. But I want you to know the concepts themselves. I want you to understand what FIFO means, first in, first out, right? And FCFS and NBF, right? So, and that's all in chapter 37. One of the largest issues that occurs with disk access is this concept of fragmentation. So whenever you're uh, reading and writing and then deleting and then rewriting, uh, you end up with quite a bit of fragmentation and this becomes very inefficient over time and it makes a larger data file uh, very, very challenging in terms of disk storage because the inode or AUs the allocation units that are um, formatted on a storage volume on a logical drive, let's say drive letter E, um, they, you know, they may only have um, 8K of space for every inode or allocation. And if you have, if you have um, a half a meg of empty disk space, but then you don't, and then you have, you know, 100K of disk space, and then you don't after that, uh, the disk heads have to read and write all over the place. This fragmentation is a, a serious problem. Does anyone know what the most common routine disk maintenance is for operating systems? What do you use in Windows? Remember the optimizing your personal technology? Can everybody see this? Are, are we yeah, still disk cleanup. okay? So disk cleanup and then defragmentation and optimization. In in Max, you don't worry about it. In Max, you simply install or uninstall software, and the Mac OS does it automatically. It does cleanup and it does defragmentation automatically. In Windows, whether it's server OS or client OS, it doesn't. And you you can schedule disk cleanup and disk defragmentation. There are scheduling options where you can write a script to automate that. Um, in Linux, um, defragmentation and optimization or disk cleanup, um, I, I wanna say is more of a manual process. So, so the best case is uh, the Mac OS where you just uninstall or install something and then as it shuffles all those data sectors around, it says, okay, we have to go to work. Let's clean up. Let's clean up the trash. And in Windows, um, you have the tools and people often think of using them when their system gets slower, but that's the other issue. Um, a lot of times people don't think of it. 
after two or three years, they think, oh, my laptop's getting old and they just go out and buy a new one. In, in Linux, it's not uncommon for people to wipe and reload images of Linux quite often. And that's just how a lot of Linux users work with um, defragmentation. Things get from bad to worse. Uh, I'm sure there are some disk cleanup or defragmentation utilities out there for Linux. Um, that might be an interesting thing to do for extra credit if anybody's interested. So a part of the conceptual framework for disk sector access is not only that there are different methods to try to become more efficient, that you have high levels of performance or higher levels of performance or security, but that there's also some overhead in the, in the way of fragmentation and you have to be able to manage that. Any questions about fragmentation? Or, or disk access algorithms? Let's see, chapter, is this working? Yeah, I'm good. Okay, so, yeah. So yeah, in here, it, in chapter 37 of your textbook, it goes into much greater detail about the disk geometry, and then it talks about the, the different methods. And, and I want you to be familiar with this and understand that there are some methods that are um, more efficient. So depending on the situation, random or sequential might, might be the preferred route. I want you to understand those uh, those distinctions. Anyway, yeah. You know, a lot of times people think that a slower SCSI data bus is going to not perform as well as a newer SATA for personal technology. And actually, um, a lot of it has to do with the width of the bits. There are whole bytes that are transferred at at a time. So the stuff that's designed for servers is actually very sophisticated. You can see this, and very sophisticated, right? And yeah, every one of these acronyms means, you have to know what that means, shortest seek time first, right? All right. Um, let's see what else. Let's look at this again. Does anyone, we just mentioned SCSI. Has anybody heard of iSCSI before? It sounds familiar. Okay. Um, but I don't recall what it's for. Does anyone remember a reference for NAS and SAN, network attached storage and storage area network? Yeah, I remember those acronyms. Okay. So the the newer and higher performance method is the storage area network. And what you're doing is, is you're replacing, just like we talked about um, USB-C and the USB 3.1 standard being many times higher bandwidth, Thunderbolt being many times higher bandwidth, um, network traffic and network performance has improved dramatically. And so a lot of systems can, can be run without disks, without storage disks. They can boot into the operating system using the network. So this is called Pixie. Um, and I don't know that that's, I'm thinking about doing an addendum on this, but it's called pre-executable environment. So in a corporate environment, you might have um, the need to overhaul a lot of different systems and what you have to do is um, the most efficient way to do this is to have a, a fresh image that's newly optimized with all the latest updates and patches and fixes and all the versions of the application suite that play nice with each other. And you stamp an image of that called, well, called an image, right? And you can, in a corporate or enterprise environment, you can boot into the network card in the pre-executable environment state, which is a character-based state, much like the Linux, it's much like the Linux terminal, right? So shell terminal. 
and you can wipe the hard drive down to the bare metal and reload it from scratch. So that's that's how far things have, have progressed in terms of local area network speeds. Everybody's familiar with gigabit ethernet right now. Um, when you were in grade school, 100 megabit was considered really fast. Uh, when I was in college, 10 megabit was considered uh, screaming. It was, it was very fast. One megabit speeds, um, one megabit speeds. So as you go back in time, it gets slower and slower and slower. Nowadays, it's efficient to run a lot of systems without having the disk, without having the overhead of the disk environment because there's a lot of space and a lot of inefficiencies. So when you're looking at condensing data center, if you look at operating systems and what's needed for adaption in modern terms, now that everybody's going to the cloud, now that everybody's putting things online with AWS, the data centers have to get rid of a lot of space and shed a lot of power and heat uh, that's generated. They have to shed a lot of power requirements and they have to reduce the heat and, and physical disks are the, are the mechanical dinosaurs of the group. So all of this is electronic and it's just flowing electrons and ones and zeros. And these are spinning platters. So much of the data centers in the world still use spinning hard disks. That's how, you know, it has a motor and uh, it has speed and there's friction and there's heat and data centers generate huge amounts of electricity. So the idea is to go electronic solid state and then put it in this you know, giant set of RAID arrays and then cluster them together in SANs and then access them across the network. So what am I saying? You can run a thousand servers with three or four SANs. If you have three or four SANs, you can run a thousand servers. But the trick is it has to boot from somewhere. And the Pixie network boot is very limited. It can only, it can only, the firmware for that doesn't cover enough for a full operating system. So iSCSI is one of the methods that, iSCSI is one of the methods that has evolved from this progression. And it's actually built into, it's actually built into uh, the operating system, uh, the operating system. So server 2019, you'll see here, it says the Microsoft iSCSI service is not running. The service is required to be started for iSCSI to function correctly, to start the service now and have the service start automatically each time the computer restarts, click the yes button. So, okay, so this gets, if you have a server and you want to be able to connect to storage area network block level access disks, you want to use something like iSCSI. There's a second method to connect to SANS storage area networks. It's called fiber. It's not the same as fiber optic that you use for internet data um, or telecommunications, uh, but, but there's a similar concept. It's just that it's not a fiber optic cable. I, there's some weirdness. There's a data backplane and uh, some of the data cables look like they're almost like cloth or cord. And so this term fiber came up when they were dealing with backplanes. It's a long story, but it's not really glass fiber. In any case, um, fiber connections, so it's FC. The standard is called FC. In any case, these are very high bandwidth, very high performance connections. And once you start them up, there's a performance hit on your machine. I'm gonna click yes, just so we can see what we're talking about here. And then I'm gonna, then I'm gonna go back into my operating system and then make some changes so it doesn't load automatically. If you're on a server class machine with plenty of hardware, plenty of memory and lots of CPU, then this is a non-issue, but I'm on a laptop and I'm demonstrating this. So it's not something I wanna leave. iSCSI is a network attachment method 
for SAN, for storage area networks, for block level access. So when we connect to, if I, if I used my machine and I said, okay, I want to come, I want to connect and map a network drive. And uh, I knew on the network what the physical address was. I could put in 146.226. I wouldn't have to use DNS. I could use DNS for names, but, but basically what we have is, uh, is, is the opportunity to use either the IP address or the, the name here. And let's just put something in there, right? You've already seen this method. And network attached storage methods, uh, network attached storage disk arrays are network enabled RAID arrays. Let's repeat that. So we're gonna talk about RAID in a minute. And if you take a RAID array and it's large enough and then you put a lot of network interfaces on it and uh, you provide a basic operating system, a basic firmware to provision this same level of connectivity across a local area network or a wide area network, you have the file level access that's brokered with UNC or with URLs in a web browser or with CIFS, it's file sharing and printing, CIFS, SMB, and RPC. We mentioned that <clears throat> these are protocols uh, that run on the local machine. There's a lot of vulnerabilities associated with that. Because we're dealing with a server and there's a lot of users on that server, hackers love to get into that Kool-Aid. And so for iSCSI, what we, what we have is a, a set of protocols that are specifically designed to provide the high performance, but also additional security. So you identify a SAN storage area network by its IP address, just like you do a network attached storage connection. Uh, you can run discovery protocols to try to find them, but, but basically a SAN is called a target. And when you connect or disconnect, you authenticate. So what am I saying? Because you're doing this across a network, your target connections, right? Your target connections and disconnections involve authentication. Everybody see this right here, radius? Yes. You okay. So radius is an acronym that has to do with remote access. It's, it's a distribution system. It's a way of automating remote connections. So everybody used to use dial-up modems to connect <laughs> to the internet. <laughs> Um, and they would squeal. I don't know if you've ever seen or heard this before, but before we had wireless and we had, uh, before we had broadband internet everywhere, we had to use um, phone systems and you had to authenticate the connection. So in large data centers, you can basically automate the connectivity and authentication to your targets using radius. So what, what am I saying? Um, let's see if we can get a picture of the, um, Lawrence Livermore. I'm gonna put a bunch of terms in here just to make the Google search interesting and let's get some images here. Okay, so does everybody see this? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so you have huge amounts of data, you have huge amounts of RAM, you have huge amounts of CPU arrays, right, clusters. And you have to be able to broker those connections. It's massively efficient to use a SAN disk to run scaled servers, hundreds of them off of just huge disk arrays. So you have these racks that have blade servers that have just, all right, and this is something I wanna share with you. If you have a blade server on each blade, it's like a card. 
it's a data card and you slide the blade or data card into the server and you can put dozens of these cards with nothing but CPU and memory and graphics. So the cards are the, the head. So when we say, we say headless computers, um, oftentimes we're referring to a computer without a screen and a keyboard and a mouse. Um, so headless isn't the exact uh, term we want to use here, but if you're using diskless servers and you want to condense them and you want to scale to something like this because you're an Amazon or you're a national laboratory and you need that kind of data, Amazon and Microsoft, all those big guys have, have this kind of an arrangement, then what you need to do is condense just this part of the data bus into a single card which we call a blade. And a blade server has dozens of these and that's it. So you're gonna have, you're gonna have racks and racks and racks that look like this. And on the back, you're gonna think, oh, this is all the same stuff, but it's not. Uh, it, from the back, it's gonna look similar, but when you look on the front, you, you'll see that all of the chassis are blade servers. Let's see if we can get another All right, here's a good, here's a good image, right? Does everybody see this right here? Yeah. Okay, you see what he has in his hand? It's like a, like a cartridge. Those are, those are blades, older style blades. So, in this space right here, you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight physical servers, each of which are capable of hosting a hundred virtual servers. So you have the equivalent of a thousand servers in this rack right here. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? Now, yes. for perspective, let me help you understand how, how massively important that is for an Amazon or a Google. This is called a pizza box. That's a one U, the, every, little, every little level, that one unit level, it's the thickness of a pizza box and they call these pizza box servers. It's a single unit high or one U high. And what they found out is that they could build massively large single servers in a 2U or 4U or 6U form factor, but it was just one machine with all sorts of CPUs. It wasn't long before they figured out that that's really not the most efficient way to do it. So they came up with this chassis where you slide in blades. Blades are much smaller than what you're seeing here. So the picture you're seeing here is actually outdated. This stuff changes every three to four years. And now they're basically the side of, a, they're the size of a much smaller card and, and they hold enough horsepower with the RAM and the CPU and the graphics, as I said, to run a hundred virtual servers. But what do you do for the IO? Does everybody see this part down here? Yes. Okay. So this part down here, those are probably hard disks and let's, um, So now you're seeing a storage area network in a rack and that's a two or three U height. So the size of a laptop, they have two different sizes. They have a standard size hard drive and then they have a smaller hard drive. And now they're, of course they've even gone to the hard drives that are the size of a stick of gum. But, but the standard laptop hard drive is two and a half inches. So in, two, in a two U form factor, if you double the height of the pizza box, you can stack the disks across like this, okay? And if you configure them to work on a block level instead of as a network attached storage, and you, you connect a lot of fiber or 
backend fabric, data fabric, or um, fiber channel, or iSCSI. All right, I'm throwing a lot of terms around here and some of the experts in the data center are cringing at this point. So I'm trying to keep it simple instead of getting too technical. But basically this is a storage area network in Iraq. And, and you would think, you know, is that a blade or a disc? Well, yeah, blades are a little larger and, and uh, they only have circuits. And then the discs basically have spinning platters, most of the conventional ones. And, and so you have, this is, each of those is probably a four terabyte disc a four terabyte disk. So by the time you finish adding all this up, you're dealing with petabytes of storage space in a rack. Well, what can you do with a petabyte of disk storage? If it's iSCSI, you can run 300 servers because all the disks are here and they're engineered to be ultra high performance, much faster than an average hard disk. And then they're designed to provide the storage disks, the volumes, the loons, logical unit of attached storage. So a loon, L-U-N, it's another term that we're gonna see here, but basically um, they, these uh, blade servers have to connect across iSCSI. I wanted you to know that this capability is built into even Windows 10. And I think there's something you can use on a MacBook to connect to an iSCSI. So you have network attached block level, ultra fast storage um, that you can use in data centers or off of data centers. And, and I wanted you to understand um, these, these ideas. I'm gonna start populating a lot of additional resources into our, so you're gonna have a lot of independent reading and, and uh, viewing. And one of the things I wanna show you quickly before we run out of time. So I, I want you to understand RAID. And there's, there's two ways to understand RAID. And, and so there's the textbook way of understanding RAID. And what you're doing is taking file system read and writes. All right, so JBOD it's important to access the PowerPoints from the, from the, um, from the module. And then, and then basically you have all of these terms, right? So just a bunch of disks, JBOD. If you take all of these disks and you string them together and you add two, let's say there's two terabytes, two terabytes and two terabytes and two terabytes and two terabytes. And, two terabytes, and I stitch them all together it's just a bunch of disks and I have an eight terabyte volume, but without redundancy or without, without interleaving the data, I don't have performance benefits, right? So when we talk about RAID, we're talking about a redundant array of, of inexpensive disks. Uh, this allows you to put some of a data file on one and some of a data file on the other and then there's an extra set over here for redundancy. And so when you're reading it back, it reads all the pieces of the data simultaneously and then assembles it in RAM. So it's much faster than a single read from a single disk. Does that make sense? It's like, it's like teaming horses. So each, if you've thought of each one of these as a horse, you have more horsepower here. If you, if you use a RAID method, you have redundancy. It's not just a bunch of disks, one big volume without redundancy. So what am I saying? It, with JBOD, if you lose one of the drives, you lose the whole eight terabyte volume. Let's repeat that. If I connect these four disks so that they're eight terabytes large, and all I'm doing is JBOD, and I lose one of the disks, I don't lose two terabytes and the other six terabytes are still intact. I lose one of these disks, I lose the whole eight terabyte volume. All of it's gone. Even if the disks on the other three good drives are intact, then the data on there is, is okay. 
How many of us want to do that for the server that 100 users depend on? Anybody? Nobody. Nobody, right? Now, ha hackers love this kind of stuff because all they have to do is change a couple of settings and it's catastrophic, right? So just think about that for a second. All it takes, if you understand this stuff, to change settings, now you're dealing with a different kind of disk, you lose your data, oops, you thought you had redundancy, you don't have redundancy. There's all sorts of shenanigans that go on. The iSCSI that we were talking about, that's across the network. That's IP based. So you're using the IP protocol to connect to the disk. Hackers love looking for radius and iSCSI protocols because they think, oh, if I get on that level, I can hack everybody's data on that on that SAN, right? I can get in, I can get in, if I can get into the SAN, I can get into everybody's stuff. So I, I know we're uh, getting strapped on time, but I'm gonna have several presentations of RAID for you because there are different levels of RAID. In RAID level one, uh, RAID zero, the idea is to build a very fast, large disk from smaller ones and RAID 0 takes this disk space and this disk space together. And then um, the only problem is that there's no redundancy. So you're teaming up the disks for performance. It's not just a bunch of disks. You're splitting up the data reads and writes so that they're split into smaller, faster uh, bursts. And that's what RAID 0 does. The basic level of RAID, it provides extra performance but then you also need redundancy, right? So if you have RAID 1, then what happens is that, um, and, and I, don't, I don't like this representation, this graphical representation is terrible, um, but there are concepts on each of these I want you to read about and, and soak in. Um, so they're still useful to, they are still useful to review, but I will have other images and other graphics to explain RAID 0, RAID 1, RAID 5, RAID 10, RAID 50, RAID 60, all that kind of stuff. And you need to know all of those different types of RAID. RAID is something you can do for a single system, but when you do it and bundle it and package it and engineer it so it's for a hundred servers, then it's iSCSI and it's a SAN. Um, are there any questions before we close today? None for me. Okay, so I need you to, I, I replaced the study guide. It's still a draft, but um, the revision notes and the side border are gone, so it's gonna be easier to read. Um, I'm gonna be posting other slides, uh, other video links I want you to watch, to engage, to explain those different concepts. Um, and if you're not already into the chapters and, um, in the textbook, you're going to want to be in the, you're going to want to be in the textbook as soon as possible. So you're going to want to engage uh, 37 to 40, 36 to 40 in our Posse Do So and the PowerPoints for the, the textbook. Okay. All right. We're going to stop sharing and stop recording. We'll see you on Tuesday. I will have some short assignments for you uh, between um, now and next Tuesday and then next week we can you'll need to be ready to review what we do for the solution and then what we do for um, the assessment okay all right sounds good